Good afternoon, everybody. Today I'm chatting with Terry Lynch from Save Canadian Mining and Power Nickel. In the Canadian junior mining world, we often hear people complain about the lack of interest from retail investors and how the game is rigged. Well, with Save Canadian Mining, Terry has a plan and he's working on it to try to save Canadian mining by trying to make the markets more fair for retail investors. And Terry's also here to talk about Power Nickel, which has seen some really strong drill results over the last year. And Terry has a whole bunch of updates and things that are happening with the company. Something I love about Power Nickel is that it's not one of those mining companies that's just simply put a piece of real estate within a publicly traded vehicle. Terry is doing everything he can to move the deal forward from selling royalties to working on offtake agreements to finding new zones to creating new private company spin outs for shareholders. You name it, Terry is working on it. All right, everybody, enjoy the interview. Terry, thanks so much for joining us today. Always great to be with you guys. Hope you're having a great day. So um, I want to start off ask, asking you about Save Canadian Mining, an initiative that you've uh, spearheaded. Um, I know that there's been various online symposiums recently where you guys have been chatting with investors and participants in the Canadian junior markets who are largely voicing their concerns with the overall lack of interest from Canadian retail investors. Um, what's the latest with Save Canadian Mining and, 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 and how is the progress coming along? Well, you know what, um, made some major, uh, discoveries that are really shocking. And, uh, as a result of it, we've got a whole new agenda and the agenda is to ban the bots, trading bots for under $250 million market cap companies. Let me explain why that must happen. Um, it'll blow you away because it blew me away. So do you know? I was I, I knew these bots were a problem, but I just thought they're trading and they have the same responsibilities as as you or I. In other words, you sell a stock, you deliver the stock, you buy the stock, you know, you pay up, etc. Well, that's not the case at all. These bots, if they've rented pipe from the banks, have different rights than you or I, which is just absolutely wrong. They have what's called short exempt status. Okay, that means that they can hit any bid. They don't have to deliver the stock. You know. It's they're short exempt as long as they keep their capital requirements up. It's unbelievable. This is the why our stocks have tanked since this has happened. Okay, so that I was uh, basically shocked to find that uh, they said, well, yeah, but they only trade nominally and not, and they're supposed to be directionless. And I said, okay, well, nominal, that's sort of like big or small. You know, uh, you know, like a two of pebble is big to me. It's small. So what's what's nominal? Is it hundred thousand shares per exchange? Is it some percentage of the twenty day moving average? You know, what is it? Well, turns out they actually don't have a definition for nominal. Isn't that convenient? Okay. And as far as directionality, nobody's policing that. Well, but wait, it gets worse. I'm going to tell you one other stunner. Okay. So I was at uh, the CSE luncheon at PDAC. You know, the, you know, you know, the naked short selling issue was sort of the keynote uh, section of the, of the luncheon. And so Richard Carlton was there and, and he said to me, um, he was chatting, he's a, C, he's a CEO of, uh, of the CSE. He said, Terry, he said, I, I learned something that's going to blow you away. And I said, wow, I mean, I've, I'm being blown away by a couple of things I've learned recently. So hit me. And he said, you know, he, he said, I, you know, obviously you're here because we, we believe in the issue. And, you know, we, we've got a number of clients that we, you know, we look at their listings and we see the trading at the end of the day and we think there's something wrong. And so that's, you know, that's why we're, we're, we're supporting this. And he said, but he said, at the same time, I talked to Ciro and Ciro tells me this is, uh, you know, just noise. It's nonsense. There's no significant failed trades. This is not an issue. So he's wondering, like he said, I'm wondering, like, which of you guys is lying? You know, how can it be? You know, like, you know, how can, how can both cases be true? And yet he said, you know, obviously, I, I don't think you're lying. I don't think my clients are lying. And I don't think Ciro's lying. So how does that work? So he said, I asked Ciro, because I said, I'm not really clear on, on this failed trade. How does, how does it work? So when does your system kick it into a failed trade? Big revelation. Ciro's system doesn't kick it into a failed trade. They do not track failed trades. You know who tracks failed trades? The broker that allowed the failed trade to happen has to call it a failed trade for it to be a failed trade. I mean, the equivalent of, uh, you know, you could commit murder, but if you don't call it murder, it's not murder. It's absolute insanity. It's, it's, it's interesting uh, you talking about your experience because I, 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 when I chat with people who are 
sort of well connected with investment banks, people who have sort of maybe worked uh, on the uh, institutional trading side for some of the junior investment banks here in Canada, um, uh, or um, some of the hedge fund guys I know, they always roll my eyes and say, this is all conspiracy nonsense. Uh, but um, I, I I believe you that there's there's there, there clearly are things that uh, these companies are, or these, we'll say hedge funds are getting away with that have basically made it so that the companies can't win and uh, and the retail investor can't win. And, and 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 how they got away with it, honestly, is because of this failed trade stuff. Was, they, they say this statistic is sort of, well, it would be caught in failed trades. As it turns out, they've jury rigged the system on failed trades. So it's it's like the fox who is eating the chickens says, oh, I'm not really eating chickens. And they, then there's no chickens eat. It's unbelievable. So that's why... You know, when you talk to and you see analysts and analysts say, no, this is just actually noise. Like if you talk to the CIBC analysts, they'll say, no, this is, this is not happening. But that's just because of this bullshit. That's what it's called. Bullshit uh, stats from Ciro because they're not effective. They're letting the banks call the shots. It's got to stop. We've got to got to ban the bots under 250 men. It's absolutely no reason for those guys to be trading there, crushing stocks on a daily basis. To whose benefit? The hedge funds benefit and the banks benefit. Destroying companies, destroying employees of companies, destroying personal individual shareholders, the mutual fund shareholders, the pension fund shareholders. Everyone's getting crushed in this scenario. And that's why our system is broken. And until we address that, it's it, it's not going to deal. But you know what? Because it's so bad, now we've got the news. We're going to make a major push to save Canadian mining. We're calling out a number of all of our partners, all the junior mining companies. We're saying, guys, look at this shocking news. We need to now stand up and demand, demand that they freeze the bots, ban the bots under 250 million. And that 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 makes a lot of sense. It it, it almost sounds like you're playing a football game, and uh, one team is allowed to have a lot more men on the field than the other team. And <laughs> how, how do you expect uh, the it's other absolute, team to win? It's absolute lunacy, you know. And and it's like. Uh, you know, I, and it's like, I, I'm not even about like, hey, is the conspiracy theory is is that this was all been planned. OK, and I'm not there. I don't really, you know, really care. I just see the problem and what it's caused. And I just say we got to stop it. OK, and then and then and, and like and the and the thing to the the banks and the hedge funds is say, hey, guys, you've been, you know, shooting fish in the barrel here for a long time. That day is over. We're coming to get you. OK, you're either going to stop it. Or we're going to sue your ass, okay? Because this has got to stop. Because now we got data. You know, we're now able to get actual data that shows this is actually happening. So this serial stuff just just is it's just not uh, you know accurate. So there was there's some noise in the junior mining world right now. Um, we got uh, I shouldn't say noise, but um, a a discussion that's happening uh, right now within the Canadian junior mining world where Frank Joostra and Pierre Lassonde are arguing that the Maple Eight, known as the big Canadian pension funds, um, should be, I'm not sure if they're saying mandated, but um, they, they should be pushed more into investing in the Canadian resource sector, in part saying we've got more money invested in China than we do in Canadian resources. Um, do, do you I, think, I, I think that, that, that this is a fair argument? I, I think it's a, a fair argument. I mean, if you look at Australia, they, you know, are probably our most analogous company, a country in the world uh, compared to Canada. And they, they certainly do it. And, and they, you know, they certainly have uh, still done well by it. And, and certainly if they were to participate now at the bottom of the cycle, uh, our pension funds would make a lot of money. Uh, you know, and I, I think it's a good idea. It should be encouraged. Uh, and then you, the other thing to encourage is remember, 90% of retail assets are in the hands of the banks. And I will tell you, it's bloody near impossible to get a bank broker to buy a junior mining stock yep. because they pretty much prohibit it. And how ridiculous is that? You know, it's just, you know, in my mind, it's just crazy that they're allowed to, uh, you know, savage this whole sector that made, you know, Canada largely is just historically was one of our biggest growth sectors. And, and it's like, you can't move a mine to China, you know? And, and now with, uh, you know, obviously the greening, you know, the transition and uh, that whole uh, clean tech, 
I mean, we could be making just phenomenal inroads for many, many years. These are high paying jobs, a lot of, a lot of taxes, you know? So, uh, I mean, it's really time to focus our, our attention on what these guys have gotten away with and they need to stop. It's, it's, it's interesting about the, the big bank broker part. Uh, I know one broker who uh, he, he took on some clients who happened to be running a Canadian junior company that was like a little five cent stock. I'm 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 not going to say the name. People might be able to figure yeah, it out, yeah. but uh, it was it was during uh, COVID, and they had COVID testing technology, and the stock ran from like five cents to over twenty dollars. And I remember saying to him, "Your your 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 office, your, your the the brokerage you work for, which was one of the big bank ones, they must be really happy with all the, with all the wealth you've created for your clients and all the people you put in it." And he actually said, "No, they're actually pissed about it." Because of all the paperwork they have to do to put people into a uh, microcap stock, you're 100 percent right. It's not. It's obviously not just mining. They they just take anybody, any small cap, like anything under a billion, and you're basically they're not interested. And I mean that's just so destructive for uh, our our economy. And you know we we allowed all these bank mergers to take place, allowed them to buy the you know got commercial banks buying investment banks, and this has turned out very badly. And uh, honestly, they need to be brought to, you know, allow people to, to invest, you know, however they want to invest, you know, and, and uh, you know, they're just concerned about, you know, protecting their own butts, and maximizing their own profit with the least amount of risk for the banks. Not got anything to do with, you know, in my mind, uh, looking after their clients' best interests or society's best interests. And, you know, uh, at, and it's only now because we're so desperate that we've woken up to this. And now like, I'm, I, I feel like that guy, remember from that movie network where you, you open up the door, Peter Finch, and he screams like, I'm sick of this shit. You know, I am sick of it. And, and it's like, I think we all should be sick of it. And it's high time that the governments collectively across the country, the provincial governments, which is, you know, run the securities laws, turn their attention to this big issue because their voters have been savage. And I say to the voters, that this is where our, our next move is, is, hey, either we get guys that listen to us or we vote them out and get guys that do, or girls, you know, whatever. You know, just get people in there that pay attention to real things that matter to us. And uh, no, knowing a lot of people uh, 40 years or less of age, I'm, I'm just picking a, a, a random number here, but uh, it's, 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 it's getting really depressing the amount of, uh, job opportunities that exist for young people in Canada. And it just, it feels like there's no effort on the part of our government to try to foster entrepreneurship and capital raising and, uh, and, 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 and in the private sector. Uh, and then you look at Canada's most recent job numbers, they're basically being masked by uh, more and more federal jobs being created by the government. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's for a lot of young people I talk to, it, it feels like things are pretty bleak here in Canada for a young Canadian who's out there I, I, trying to make their way. I'm so saddened by it, you know, and I, and I, I agree with the sentiment, you know, and, and it's like, you know, it, it's just, uh, we really should be, this should be Canada's generation. What's going on right now with, with, with all the push to the, the greening of the economies and, and that sort of thing, because our, our mineral wealth is unsurpassed. We've got great leadership still in the mining sector that could, you know, develop these things properly. Although, I mean, that's thinning out as we know, you know, but it's like, God, you know, we've got this generational opportunity to create a lot of wealth for, for our country, you know, to give people hope again. And uh, we got to get to it. You know, that's why we, and, and like what I've been saying to my friends and my peers in the space is that, you know, the activism that we tried with the safety and mining of initially lobbying, provincial governments, et cetera, that did not work at all, period. You know, uh, what we need is much more activists. We need to be in their face. We need to be tweeting them. We need to be doing press releases. You know, we need to consider the class action lawsuits. I mean, all of this to get attention. And we have to lobby our MPPs and MLAs. And we need to say, guys, this is important to us. It's important to your voters. It's important to you. And that's the only way we're going to get this change. Let's uh, talk power nickel. Uh, you guys recently had some success testing a uh, PGM zone at the NISC project. What can you tell us? Yeah, you know, that thing is uh, kicking it 
uh, is really an uh, impressive zone. Uh, we've now had, I guess, four, you know, really good step outs. So, uh, you know, we'll see what the numbers show, but uh, we're expecting similar grades to what we had. So that, I mean, we're probably, uh, I'm guessing we're pushing to half a million ounces there, which is amazing with that few number of holes. And when you think that, like when our stock's at 20 cents, it's a joke. Uh, but I mean, it, it's like we've got, uh, we're showing that we're going to be a nickel mine. And now we're going to have a, you know, a PGM uh, kicker to a big one. And uh, it just keeps getting better on the drilling bit side. Um, you know, obviously frustrating on the stock side, but uh, at some point one would think uh, it would turn. What's uh, the, the plan for 2024 in terms of exploration strategy, drills on the ground? What can you yeah, tell us? So we've got uh, right now two drills on the ground. Uh, one's uh, pretty much focused on Wildcat and proving that up. The other is, uh, you know, basically following up on the NISC main and, and also uh, our ambient noise uh, targets that we developed with Fleet Space Technologies. So we're, we're, we're expanding the nickel zones there. And we think we pretty much have got our best, uh, you know, uh, exploration targets we've ever had. And we'll be drilling from now until the end of April. Uh, second thing we'll be doing is we're, uh, CVMR has been doing a feasibility study on the project, uh, which we'll expect to report on in Q3, but we'll get a, a, a uh, we'll get a first look at it in basically, we'll get a, uh, a thing probably, uh, in about two weeks, we'll have, uh, the first reports out and they'll be talking about, you know, the, uh, the, you know, how much more recovery we're going to make in this system probably go from 70% nickel recovery to 90%. So that'll be huge. And we'll talk about some business development things that are happening on the uh, on the refinery side, which is super exciting. So that's coming uh, in, in the next couple of weeks. And then the other big news that'll be happening is we're spinning out our uh, copper gold uh, projects into a new uh, private company initially. And the reason why we're doing it privately, uh, Steve, is that is that basically the, um, uh, the, one of the things we've found in our sort of research on on uh, short coverages, et cetera, is obviously we filed power nickel file with Ciro and Finra a complaint about the naked shorting in our stock. Obviously, we've heard nothing back from these guys on that. Uh, but one of the ways we can uh, capture these guys, we believe, is by dividending out uh, private company stock. That's not something that can be papered over in the public marketplace. So, you know, what happens in a naked shorting is counterfeiting, right? You have counterfeit shares. So in other words, instead of having 150 million power nickel shares, maybe there's 200 million out there or more. So what happens is all these guys are going to be expecting to get this dividend. They're not going to get it because they don't actually own the stock, unfortunately. But they'll be able to force their broker, we think, to buy in. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing that. Okay. Well, you just answered a whole bunch of my questions there. Um, uh, so let's let's finish it with this. Um, uh, if, if we're an investor watching here, um, uh, over the remainder of 2024, uh, what should they be really looking out for to be excited about, uh, in terms of, uh, maybe drill results yeah. or. Yeah. So I, I would, I would think, you know, uh, we'll have drill results out in about three weeks on that wildcat. So that should be pretty exciting. Uh, obviously we we'll, uh, you know, we've got the CVMR update. That'll be pretty exciting. We've got the spin out and then, uh, the drill results will continue uh, really, it'll start in about three weeks, and then every two weeks or so until August, they'll keep on coming. And uh, then we think the feasibility study will be out in in uh, in Q3, and that'll show in our mind uh, that this NISC mine is very uh, feasible and super economic. And we'll expect to put together a, a, a business development deal on that uh, sometime in H2. So we think uh, this is going to be an epic year for Power Nickel. And I've said to people, I was interviewed in Vancouver at the VRIC thing, and they asked me my sentiments on the market. I said, obviously, it's a crap market, okay? But you know what? It's like Rick Rule said, the cure for low prices is low prices. I'm saying to people, they should get off half their wallet now. And, and the reason why I'm saying that is that whether they buy power nickel or they, they buy a good uh, mining fund, you know, uh, Palace Capital, BT Global, CI, McKenzie, and there's a number of great funds out there. There are many ways to play this bounce. One of the things that you'll find, I think you'll agree, is that one of the best moves in investing is when you go from bad to less bad, okay? And often stocks will double just because they've been so oversold. And then maybe they'll go on 
to be a 10 bagger or a hundred bagger. But you know what happens to people that sit on the sidelines? They watch the double and then they think, oh my God, I meant to buy that stock. They don't get in and then they don't buy. And then they miss the, all the run. You know, I've done it myself. I probably, you have too. And I'm saying to people, people, it's happening. This thing is going to get fixed. We're going to create such furor on this issue that they're, they're going to have no choice but to fix it. And, and as a result of fixing this, this is going to create the biggest mining boom in history. And you want to be on the side of that. And if you have to wait a couple months for that to happen, so be it. You're going to be a lot happier being in for two months than being on the sidelines when it does pop. And you're going to say, oh, my God, I didn't do it. And it, it, it's, it's so interesting because I, I, I've met with so many companies at PDAC and uh, just from doing my own research that have that have discoveries and they've got lots of money that's been spent historically drilling and they and some of them even have some okay cash positions on their balance sheet um and they're trading at market caps less than 10 million in some cases less than 5 million and, and it's it's like if you invested it at 10 million and they had the the drill holes that they put out just you know 3 years ago or even a year ago you'd expect the stock to be trading at 50 to 100 million dollars and that's going to happen. I think that those, those recoveries will happen. I think we have to tell our people to be patient, to, uh, you know, if they don't feel they can stomach the individual stocks, buy the mutual fund. So at least you're, you're going to participate. But I'm, I'm you know, I, I think we can really say to them, honestly, this is going to happen now and now's the time to buy. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm committed. You know, we're, we're committing more money uh, all the time. So uh, I'm, I'm following my own uh, medicine. Well, Terry, I always appreciate talking to you. Uh, please keep coming back on here in the future. Uh, both, we love hearing about everything that's happening with Save Canadian Mining, and it's good to see somebody who's actually trying to do something about all the problems that exist as opposed to just sitting around complaining about it. So I very much appreciate all your efforts with that. And uh, as a shareholder of Power Nickel, I appreciate all the efforts you put in there. I, I know you're one of the hardest working guys in the business. I, I say it to you every time I see you, and I do mean that. I, you, I see you at every conference. You're always uh, out there um, doing your best for shareholders. And that's not something that goes unnoticed with myself, who's invested in a lot of companies and seen a lot of uh, CEOs who are just uh, always at the same bars, always talking to the same people. And I'm scratching my head going, why aren't you out there working your deal? Uh, I know that that uh, you're one guy who comes front of mind when I think about people who are constantly doing whatever it takes to move their deals forward. And uh, I, I, I always appreciate that. Uh, and, and and want to acknowledge well, that whenever I get a chance to talk well, to you. Thank you so much, Steve. That's high praise. We really appreciate it. And you know, we uh, we're committed. We 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 just are. We're like a dog in the bone at Power Nickel. We just think we got an outstanding ore body, and we're going to get paid for it. So we're we're going to do all we can to make sure that happens as soon as possible for our shareholders. Perfect. Thanks so much for doing this, Terry. Cheers. Thanks, guys. All right, everybody, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this interview, please smash that like button, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. Thanks, everyone.